Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start by just welcoming everybody and new people are still coming on. So keep coming, keep coming. Um, I'll say that uh, the, the uh, uh, we've always tried to do something in Black History Month and this year we read this book and we are in, Megan, is it one week or two weeks? We're gonna show, uh, we're gonna ask people on their own to watch the half hour documentary Greg, what's the name of it that uh, OPB did? Uh, I think it's, uh, what is it? I think it's, um, <laughs> you would you didn't tell me you're gonna ask me the name of that. I don't remember. <laughs> well, you, you get to speak in it. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, it's a black, it's an Oregon experience and it's uh, black history in Oregon. Right, so and I'll send the link out, but we thought we'd uh, ask everybody to watch that on their own and then we come together and have a, uh, a discussion of that as well. Sounds good. Okay. So now here's my official introduction. I met Greg Noakes when he was working for the Oregonian and he was kind of touring around the state. Uh, he was back from years uh, on the East Coast and internationally with Associated Press and others. And he came to the Oregonian and when he was wandering around the country here, he came on the Chinese massacre story. And he doggedly pursued that story for years. In fact, he still is. He just sent me something, uh, a magazine article he'd written with uh, more about the deathbed confession on that, on that uh, cloudy part of our Willow County past. At any rate, um, so Greg and I go back a long time because I haven't been in the bookstore for over 30 years. And uh, it's always great to see him. We did do a, uh, we showed uh, the Chinese massacre film that OPB did here um, to a full house four or five years ago. And uh, if we weren't in COVID now, we might show the, uh, the black history one. But anyway, I'm gonna let it go there, uh, Greg and invite you to speak. And again, everybody um, jot down your questions in the chat box. And Greg tells me he's got a, I don't know, a half hour introduction or so. Something like that. And then it'll be reading, over. right? Okay. So the, um, I just wanted to say, Rich, thanks for having me. You know, my very first, the first book I wrote was Massacred for Gold. And the very first event presentation I made on the book was at the Fish Trap House. Yep. And uh, that was quite an event because I thought people up there would be very hostile to the book and was kind of worried about the reaction. But it was very well received, at least by those people who came to the Fish Trap House that evening. But we're going to talk to you about uh, my, this book, Break. In Chains, which was my third book about the slavery story in Oregon and the, the Northwest. And how did I come to this story? Well, my grandparents had written this 1500 word family genealogy called the Henkel genealogy. Now I'll be right up front and say I never read it. I barely even opened the cover, but my brother had read it. And so I was looking for another book to write after Massacred for Gold. And I had several ideas and bounced these off my brother who said, um, well, why don't you write about Reuben Shipley? And I, well, who's Reuben Shipley? And he said, well, he was a slave brought to Oregon by one of our ancestors. And well, how do I find out about Reuben Shipley? And he said, well, it's in that Henkel genealogy on page 353. Well, I was amazed in several ways to know there ever was a, were slaves in Oregon, one and two that uh, that I had ancestors who brought a slave to Oregon, three that my brother had bothered to look through the book, but he had. Um, so that set me off on the journey, and I'm going to come back to Reuben Shipley a bit later if there's time, but I want to get into to the rest of the story. So. Um, in 1843, the first major wagon train came out from Missouri to Oregon. It was called the Great Migration. There had been earlier settlers coming to Oregon, but never in such numbers. There were about 1,000 white settlers on that wagon train. And one of the leaders was a captain, was Peter Hardiman Burnett. And Burnett was born in Tennessee, was a sole sought attorney, um, 
she married into a slaveholding family, a major slaveholding family, the people that, that, that started Nashville, Tennessee. And he had a couple of slaves of his own, moved to Missouri where he got involved with the uh, in, with a law firm that rep, you know, represented uh, Joseph Smith following what was known as the 1838 Mormon War. But he fell into financial hard times. He was a terrible businessman, but a good organizer. So he organized the first wagon train to Oregon, the Great Migration, recruited people for the wagon train and led it out to Oregon. And just as a man, matter of us became chairman of what was known as the first legislative council of Oregon and I'll come back to that in just a moment and went on to become governor of California so as somebody accumulated a lot of he had a lot of smarts could do things but he didn't make money so he had he as head of Oregon's legislative council he was very much a racist when he came out and before he came out there was a beginning of a provisional government which met in Oregon at uh, in Champui, town of Champui in 1843. And they enacted certain organic laws as they were called for Oregon. One of which read, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory otherwise than in the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. No ifs, ands, or buts, no slavery. Well, as I said, Burnett had his own slaves. And um, so he led, he didn't like that law and he had several other people in the wagon train also brought out a handful of uh, slaves in this period. And um, so he had the law changed. And so he kept the part about no slavery would be, uh, slavery would not be allowed, but in section two of that law, it said that in all cases where slaves have been or shall hereafter be brought into Oregon, the owner of such slaves shall have the term of three years from the introduction of such slaves to remove them out of the country. So you read through that and you see that he was authorizing slavery for up to three years in Oregon. And then what would happen if, a, if once a slave had to be freed, well, if that of such owner of slaves shall neglect or refuse to remove such slaves from the country within the time specified in the preceding action, such slaves shall be free. And then what would happen to that free African-American? <clears throat> I can't quite see my, my thing up here. So how do I look through this, Rich? Use your arrows. My arrows. On your on your laptop or computer. Uh, no. Um, okay, you got it. Well, I was trying to get. Um, I was trying to be able to read this Lash Law, but basically, the 1847 Exclusion Law provided that slave owners would have three years they could keep their slaves. Then they would have to free them. And then free African-Americans would have to leave Oregon. And if they didn't, they would be subject to a severe lashing of up to 39 lashes. We don't know if that was ever executed in this period. Jesse Applegate the next year changed that law so that it was no longer was, was slavery authorized in Oregon. And there was no longer to be lashing in Oregon. But the fact that that law existed in Oregon's books was quite a surprise to me. Um, that was the first of the exclusion laws. There were three exclusion laws in Oregon. The next one was in um, 1849. Although the legislative committee abolished the 1844 exclusion law in 1845, the first territorial legislature enacted a new exclusion law in 1849. Once again, the fear of an alliance between blacks and the tribes was a contributing, contributing cause. The preamble to the new law declared it would be highly dangerous to allow free Negroes and mulattoes to reside in the territory or intermix with Indians. It easily passed the legislature, 
It did not apply to African Americans already in the territory, of which there were very few, but newcomers would have to leave. Section one stipulated, it shall not be lawful for any Negro or mulatto to enter into or reside within the limits of this territory. Um, the first violation would result in arrest. The second violation would cause a Negro or mulatto, if convicted, to be fined and imprisoned at the discretion of the court. That law lasted in Oregon for five years. And I might say at this point that Oregon during its early history had exclusion laws against blacks for most of its people know well tell why there is such a small or was such a small black population in Oregon. So getting that 1850 or 49 law abolished took some tricks on the part of people who opposed it, one of whom was on the screen in front of you now, Reuben Boyce. And I'm gonna read just a little bit here. The repeal of Oregon's 1849 exclusion law in 1854 has long been considered inadvertent, an omission made by mistake during a rewriting of Oregon's territorial laws by a three-member code commission. The territorial legislature repealed all laws not specifically included in the new code. One of those was the exclusion law. As later explained by House Speaker Lafayette Grover, by inadvertence, the act pro prohibiting the immigration of Negroes was admitted in that repealing act. Once the error was discovered, Grover, who was very much against blacks, immediately moved to reinstate it, which passed the house, but failed in the council. While Grover's claim that the law was left out by accident has been widely accepted, there is reason to believe that the omission was not entirely inadvertent. The fact that the council rejected the attempt to reinstate the exclusion law suggests the omission met with some approval. Moreover, one of the members of the three member code commission was Reuben Boyce, a future chief justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, who over time would demonstrate support for African Americans. Boyce was elected to the House, assigned to shepherd the new code through that body. Did he have a hand in the confusion that caused the exclusion law to be overlooked? It is worth speculating. It is also noteworthy that the commission employed Joseph Wilson as a clerk to transcribe the drafts of the new code for presentation to the legislature. Wilson would later serve on the Supreme Court and with Chief Justice Boyce would invite controversy by attending a wedding of a black couple in Salem in 1863. Several subsequent attempts to enact a new exclusion law by the territorial legislature failed. The support wasn't there. The final attempt during the 1856-1857 session of the legislature was led by Grover, a future governor who after the Civil War would torpedo Oregon's ratification of the 15th Amendment, granting, growing, granting voting rights to African Americans. Um, Asa Lovejoy, one of the founders of Portland, argued in the House that the proposal to prohibit slaves as well as free Blacks was an attempt to expose pro slavery legislators by forcing them into opposition said Lovejoy, who represented Clackamas County, I believe this bill is an abolition measure, got up to sound the opinion of people on the question of slavery and find out what ground gentlemen stand on. He claimed that the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act had already opened a path to slavery in Oregon. The leader of the opposition was Oregonian editor Thomas Dreyer, an anti-slavery Whig, an editor of the Oregonian. He wrote, there are some free Negroes now in Oregon. And he wrote about two of them were prominent uh, in business. Mr. Francis living in the city of Portland is a black man and a good citizen, a man of property who attends his own business and does as much for the country as any other man in the country. They blacks have committed no crime. Why not make a law to exclude Irishmen, Chinamen, Italians, Englishmen and all of the foreigners? Such a law would be just as Republican. It strikes me that this law would be a disgrace to Oregon. 
When the exclusion bill came to a vote, the bill failed in the House by a vote of 23 to 3. The issue could not be put to rest, however. In November 1837, a new exclusion law, Oregon Third, was approved by Oregon voters. This time as a clause in Oregon's constitution. The debate in the Constitutional Convention that placed the exclusion measure before voters reflected a deep-seated hostility toward all minorities and at least symbolically marked a low point in Oregon history. This is Lafayette Grover. And um, I wish I could read, the, read what he wrote here because I had it written down. Basically, says, I am one of those people who believes that the government of the United States is a government of white men, a declaration of independence with the declaration of the equal and natural free citizenship of white men. And throughout his life as governor and a U.S. senator, he was always very much against blacks in Oregon. So in 1857, the Oregon Constitutional Convention met in Salem, and this is a sketch of the old uh, courthouse where delegates from the then 19 counties met to decide on Oregon's constitution. There was no issue more important before the delegates than whether Oregon would be a slave state. And I can't tell you who are watching out there that as I went through this story, I was just astounded to read of this history that there was so much pro-slavery sentiment in Oregon and how close Oregon did become to becoming a slave state in this period. Now, Oregon was not an exception. Other states in, in the West and the North were going through what the South went through, but none of them went as far as Oregon with their exclusion acts and, and um, to entertain slavery as much as Oregon did in this period. In 1857, shortly before the Constitutional Convention met, George George Williams, uh, from Massachusetts, who was appointed to Supreme Court Justice by, by uh, President uh, <clears throat> Pierce, um, wrote a letter which was opposing slavery. And up to this point, slavery, the convention was only a, a month away and slavery had an awful lot of momentum. And George Williams wrote in a letter that was played over front page of the Salem Statesman, I know what siren song self-love sings for slavery, how pleasant it seems in prospect to have a slave at tiller ground, to wait upon us while we wait and famous while we sleep. But establish slavery here and the effect will be the same as elsewhere. You will turn aside that tide of free white labor which has poured itself like a fertilizing flood across the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and now, is now murmuring up the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains. Um, this, that seemed to turn the tide on the slavery debate. Uh, historian Walter Carl Wood Woodward, writing in 18, 1910, said up to this time, pro-slavery sentiment had been steadily rising. From the publication of the Free State Letter onto the election in November, it seemed steadily to recede, and it did recede. But I should say at this point that this letter was a much longer letter. It was a very racist letter. Williams basically wrote very critically of blacks. They could not do the work of white men, that they would be corrupt, that they would bring a lot of unlawful activity into Oregon. And probably because of that content in this letter, it did not receive a lot of attention because of its racism. Williams, who did not portray himself as a racist, said in later years that he wrote it that way only because it was the only way that he could get white support for his position that the slavery would not work in Oregon, be that as it may. So anyway, there was still an awful lot of people who were pro-slavery in Oregon, a lot of leaders, and one of them was Matthew Deedy, and that name might be familiar to you. Matthew Deedy arrived in Oregon in 1858 or so um, with a group of uh, mounted riflemen, and he was appointed president of the Constitutional Convention. He would later be appointed by President Pierce as a U.S. District Judge, and he was the founder of the University of Oregon Law School, and I'll come back to that in a second. But he was an unapologetic advocate of slavery. If a citizen of Virginia can own a slave, of which there is no doubt, and a citizen of Oregon can lawfully this, own the same right, own, own the same right of property in a Negro, whether purchase or inheritance. 
And that wasn't the eve of the convention. Um, deity, it might be known, the University of Oregon Law School was the founder of the University of Oregon Law School. And Deedee Hall, the main law school building, built in 1873, was named for him. And only the last year, because of the Black Rights Movement, has uh, his name been removed from the law school. So it was now called University Hall or something like that. But he lasted as US District Judge almost until his death in uh, 1890. Never apologized for his pro-slavery attitude. Jesse Applegate was another delegate to that convention. He was a pioneer from Missouri who fled slavery in Missouri. He did not like slavery, um, but as a farmer, to hire men to work on his farm, he could only hire black slaves. There were just not white workers who wanted to do that kind of work. So you had to pay a slave owner to rent a slave to work on his farm. He hated that. Um, and so he was one of the captains of the wagon train that came out to Oregon in that period. And he argued in the, in the convention against slavery. The discussion of, this, of slavery by this body is out of place and uncalled for it and only calculated to en en engender bitter feelings among members of the body and a retardist business. So hang on just a minute. Sheesh. I can't stop that phone. Anyway, you'll see a sketch of Jesse Applegate. He did not allow himself ever to be photographed because he felt he was too ugly and he may have been. So this was a sketch by a grandson. Damn it. Sorry about that. Anyway, Rich, he argued against slavery and um, it was, and didn't even want it debated, but it was debated nevertheless. This is uh, Joseph Lane who testified before the Constitutional Convention. He might be familiar to Lane County is named for him. He was appointed Oregon's first territorial governor by President Polk. He was a US Senator, one of the first US Senators from Oregon. The candidate for president was John Breckinridge on a slave state ticket in 1860. Um, I was a who testified in favor of changing uh, Lane County's name from Lane, but that would be hard to do. But it is named for a very, it is named for Joseph Lane, who ran against Abraham Lincoln on a slave state ticket. All these things I didn't know as a kid raised in Oregon just blew me away. Anyway, he was quoted as saying, we have under the constitution as much right to hold our property slaves and have them protected as we have to hold our cattle and have them protected. Just another prominent person who favored slavery in Oregon in that period. This was some of the debate that went on at the constitutional convention, even though Applegate did more such a, this is an excerpt, I have a much longer debate in my book, Breaking Chains, much more of the debate, but uh, Thomas Dreyer from Multnomah County, who I mentioned earlier, the people sent us up here to debate the question and submit it to them for a decision. The question of slavery is the all important question in Oregon now. Delazone Smith, U Lynn County, a future US Senator. Hundreds in the country were for a free, free if for free Negroes were kept out of the state, but if we were to have Negroes, let them be slaves. Erasmus Shattuck, Washington County, it should be known to our children whether they live under a free or slave state constitution. I am for a free state and I wish to be that to be understood. A.J. Lovejoy, Clackamas County, who I mentioned earlier, one of the founders of the city of Portland was pro-slavery. You can't keep this Negro question it will out, it will come up in some shape and the convention has got to meet it, but it didn't. Um, they couldn't agree on a, on a measure so they submitted the issue to voters along with the constitution. And on the ballot was, do you vote for slavery in Oregon? Now, keep in mind that the free state letter had been out, had a lot of influence apparently. So the vote for slavery was not as much as people might've expected. For slavery, 2,645. Against slavery, 7,727. A companion clause for the constitution 
do you vote for free Negroes in Oregon? For exclusion, 8,640. Against exclusion, 1,081. Overwhelmingly for what became Oregon's third exclusion law. That law would last until 1926. And it read, no free Negro or mulatto, not resident in the state at the time of the adoption of the constitution shall come reside or be within the state or hold any real estate or make any contracts or maintain any suit therein. And the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes and for their effectual exclusion from the state and for the punishment of persons who will should bring them into the state or employ or harbor them. As I said, that state in the Constitution until 1920, and in the Constitution until 1926, 70 years, which I found extraordinary. Now, of course, it no longer applied because of the amendments that came out of the Civil War and made all of this moot. But in 1900, there was an effort to, to eliminate this from the Constitution, and voters rejected eliminating this from the Constitution. Quite a statement still about the degree of racism that there was in Oregon in that period. It was finally removed in 1926 at the efforts of William McCoy, who was the very first black legislator in Oregon. Um, I'm gonna mention the amendments just for a minute. There was in, um, all of the amendments except for the 13th amendment were very controversial that came out of the civil war. The 13th amendment banishing slavery in Oregon was approved on December 5th, 1865. The 14th amendment granting citizenship and equal protection of the laws was approved in 1865. But three years later, it was disapproved um, by people who felt that it was an infringement on states' rights it was reapproved in 18, 1973, again with the instigation of William McCoy. The Voting Rights Act, the 15th Amendment, was not brought before the legislature at all. Grover, who was Lafayette Grover, who was the governor of Oregon, refused to bring for the convention arguing infringement on states' rights, and even the public, because the amendment had been approved by the, by the other states. Nevertheless, Oregon did not approve that in 1959 and quietly, and it wasn't much different in California, which hadn't approved the Voting Rights uh, 15th Amendment until 1962. So you're looking now at a headless picture of Harriet Ford and Nathaniel Ford. Nathaniel Ford brought out the most slaves to Oregon in this period. And this connects to a family story, the Reuben Shipley story I mentioned earlier. Nathaniel Ford was a big deal in Missouri, lived in Fayette, was a county sheriff, served in the legislature, had a lot of slaves, but financial hard times that hit him. So he organized his own wagon train in 1844, and he brought out six slaves, the most of any of the slave, the most of any slaves brought by any one person, six slaves. And he was finally sued in 1852 by a former slave, Robin Holmes, which became Oregon's only slave trial. And my apology to Mrs. Ford for cutting off her head. I didn't mean to do that. One of the slaves brought out to Oregon by Nathaniel Ford. And this is the only picture we have of any one of them. It was uh, Polly, Polly, or Mayor Jane Holmes who married the slave brought up by one of my ancestors, Reuben Shipley, which makes us a bit of a family story. So she was um, at issue in what was the 1852 slave trial. So what happened to Faneuil Ford, the parents of the, of, the, of the people, Robin and Polly Holmes were the two adult slaves brought up by Nathaniel Ford. And they arrived in Oregon at a time, that brief period when slavery was lawful because of what uh, Peter Burnett had done in that period. Um, so he argued for his freedom and eventually he was given his freedom. Nathaniel Ford made him go to California and mine gold on his behalf. And when he came back, he got his freedom and his wife's freedom. But Nathaniel Ford kept their four children saying, I brought them out as little kids across the across the plains, I fed them and clothed them, and now I'm entitled to some of their labor. 
So Rob, Robin Holmes, with uh, the help of Reuben Boyce, who you saw earlier, brought suit against uh, Nathaniel Ford for the freedom of his children. And they won that case. That was the only slavery case uh, Holmes v. Ford ever decided in Oregon, extraordinary, extraordinary to me, there was ever a slavery case in Oregon, you know, in that period. Um, but the slaves were freed. This was George George Williams. And you, I saw, you saw him earlier, later on, he would be the one who would uh, write the Free State letter. He was from New York, appointed uh, at that time judges before Oregon became a state, the judges were appointed by the federal government, by the president. And so this was Franklin Pierce had appointed him and Williams was anti-slavery. And so in his ruling, he said he held that without, which I could pull this darn thing up here. Hang on just a second. This is what William said about his ruling. Whether or not slaveholders could carry their slaves into the territories and hold them there as property had become a burning question. And my predecessors in office, for reasons best known to themselves, had declined to hear the case. This was among the first cases I was called upon to decide. Mr. Ford contended that these colored people were his property in Missouri from which he emigrated and he had as much right to bring that kind of property into Oregon and hold it here as much as he had to bring his cattle or other property here and hold it as such. But my opinion was, and I so held that without some positive legislative enactment establishing slavery here, it did not and could not exist in Oregon and they awarded the colored people their freedom. So far as I know, this was the last effort made to hold slaves in Oregon by force of law. There were a great many virulent pro-slavery men in the territory, and this decision, of course, was very distasteful to them. Williams went on to be a U.S. Attorney General under, under President uh, Grant and was very active in uh, per prosecuting some of the Ku Klux Klan people in that period. And this is one of the last slides I'll show you. This is the cemetery it, near Philomath called the Mount Union Cemetery. And this was a property that became a farm. Reuben Shipley, who was a slave brought by my, one of my ancestors, was given his freedom after several years, self-educated, bought a hundred acres and established his farm. And after he married, uh, uh, Mary, Mary Jane Holmes, um, they, they worked this farm together and they donated three acres for a cemetery significantly that allowed both blacks and whites, uh, blacks as well as whites to be buried on that cemetery. And so he is buried here, his wife is buried here, a number of his blacks are buried here, and a number of my ancestors are buried there. So it's just significant in my family history. And I will end it with uh, a comment about this, this upcoming book um, that's called Eminent Oregonians, it will be out later this year. I've written one chapter on, on Jesse Applegate, but it also has the chapters, long chapters on Abigail Scott Dunaway, the, the uh, women advocate for, uh, for, for uh, votes for women, Richard Newberger, and Chief Joseph. And I cannot uh, pronounce the misperse name that's used there on the cover. And if anybody want to know any more about Peter Burnett and his story, his, his story, I've written this book about Peter Burnett. So that's up. I've taken a lot of time. I'd like to open this up for questions. Um, I'm going to stop the share here. So who's going to start? Muted. I'm muted. Thank you very much, Greg. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I think the easiest thing, I'll, I'll read a couple of these questions and you can deal with them, okay? Yes. Uh, the last one is maybe the easiest one, was, uh, was exclusion removed by statute or by a referendum in 1926? 
referendum. Referendum. Right. Okay. So, um, yes. It was, it was very, almost nothing was mentioned about it in the paper at the time. It was so embarrassing to people by this period that Oregon still had this on his books. Very little attention was given to it. So it was sort of almost a quiet election. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so uh, Elnora said that she thought reading your book that Robin Holmes and his wife would not have won their case if any other judge except Judge Williams had ruled on the case. I think that's you probably agree. true. We don't know that for sure. Uh, three judges before Williams had taken up the case. All of them, all of them um, uh, appointed by people like Andy Jackson, Polk, were two post-slavery uh, presidents. <laughs> and uh, it happened that, uh, that the first one who was not pro-slavery was Williams, who was appointed by a president. Pierce, who was not pro-slavery. So slavery made a big difference in who were appointed to the government leaders in Oregon. And there's no doubt, those other three justices that, uh, that, are, that are mentioned in the book, they kind of kicked the story around. Nobody wanted to, to decide it. One justice was clearly on the side of the Holmes. On the other, Senate was clearly on the side of the prominent uh, slaveholders in the area. So uh, Greg Kathleen Ackley says that she grew up in Oregon and uh, was taught history in Oregon schools, but got none of this. <laughs> Have there been changes? Is it being taught now? Do you think? It's extraordinary, Rich. And I was, it blew me away because I was raised in Oregon schools. I um, studied history in college. I knew about the amendment in the constitution. I knew something about that. I did not know Joseph Lane ran on a slave state ticket. I did not know that there had been slave, ever slaves in Oregon. I did not know one of my ancestors brought a slave. I didn't know that slavery was debated at the Oregon Constitution. I didn't know any of those things. So when I just got into his book, I was just like, God, can this be true? These exclusion laws, no idea. And um, it just blew me away and yes, Things are not taught. We get our Oregon history in the fourth grade. And so if any school teachers would know about it, and not very many school teachers do, the, um, it's not something they're gonna be teaching their students in that period. So if you wanna know about it, you really have to go in depth into Oregon history. Now I should say that blacks like um, uh, Daryl Milner, who taught for many years at, uh, at Portland State, uh, head of the Department of Black Studies. Black people know about it much more than white people know about it because it's more a part of their history because some of them came out in this period as slaves and, and these stories are much more familiar to them. Should see some of their ancestors came out as slaves. I should have made that clear. So, um... Uh, I should let people just pose their own questions, but this is maybe more efficient for now, at least. Elaborate on the concern of allowing African Americans to mix freely with tribal people. Is that a, you mentioned it at one point there. Was that a, a deep concern? It was a deep concern briefly for that second exclusion law in that period. There had been the Whitman massacre, what, in 1847. I think I've got that year right. And so, it was believed that tribes were on the warpath, quote unquote, in that period because of what happened to the Whitmans. And there were a couple of attacks in other places too. And so there was a lot of fear that, I mean, it's also been interesting in the South, everybody knows that the white slave owners kind of feared their slaves. This is one of the reasons why they kept them under such tight control. They knew instinctively what they're doing wasn't right. Um, I'm, I make an editorial decision judgment when I say that, but I think that's probably true. So they're always worried about slave uprisings. Well, many of the of the, the first settlers in Oregon came out here. We're from Missouri and we're from the slave states. Most of them did not bring slaves, but they had that experience of being fearful of slaves. And so you now had Indians upset and having killed a number of whites. I think what I mean, I mean I might be wrong, I think 18 whites, including the Whitmans, were killed up at, uh, at near Walla Walla in that period. And there was other uprisings among the Native Americans. So it was just this fear 
that had no basis in fact that the blacks again, who weren't very many anyway would somehow join with the uh, with indians to overthrow defeat kill the whites and i should mention there is one incident where a fellow named joseph Sauls was accused of killing a white man in oregon city in this period in a, in a dispute over a horse so that kind of entered into it too in this period but fear you mentioned the the settlers coming out the what you mentioned you mentioned the settlers coming out from missouri and kansas and places that were either slave states or or, or disputed uh was it but though only only one brought six six slaves were they uh were they more the were the people coming out poorer and didn't have slaves and looking for land was that the well, the impetus was, was an economic collapse of uh, depression in that period in the late 1830s and early 1840s. The economy had really gone into the tank. Uh, Nathaniel Ford who was a big slaveholder in Missouri. He had to sell off like one third of his slaves, you know, in this period in order to make ends meet. And then the draw of Oregon, this was free land. I mean, you get up to a square mile of free land and what, you know, that was great. And so you could, if you had long family members to help you, my, your, you develop your farm, wonderful. Um, others just brought along a few slaves to help them get started. Like Robert Shipley in Missouri, my white ancestor brought his uh, black slave, Reuben Shipley, out to help him get his farm started. Made a deal, I'll free you after several years if you, if you do this for me. And that was case, probably most of the slaves in that period were freed that way after several years. I should say nobody was keeping track in this period. Although anecdotally, it is interesting that the 1840 census included three Oregon slaves in it. In Lynn County, there was two different uh, property, white men who were, recording things on the census actually listed slaves in their household as slaves, which was kind of remarkable. Many others listed blacks as servants. But of course, by the time the, 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 the census report went to the federal government and came back, there was no slaves in Oregon because there weren't supposed to be slaves in Oregon. But people were upfront in some cases about having slaves because nobody gave a damn. And that's basically what was going on. So Evelyn wants to know what you think the status of blacks are in present time. Better, obviously. Um, I've, I've tried to be modestly supportive of the black rights movement without being particularly supportive of the cancel culture and their contradictions there. You know, I like seeing a statue of Abraham Lincoln in downtown Portland never quite understood why well, that had to come down. And it didn't have to come down, of course. Um, but there are, there are, I went to high school, I guess, with about Washington, old Washington High School, about, had more blacks than any other high school, probably about one quarter of the student body was blacks. And they were regarded as kind of others, you know, if that, if that means anything to people, you know, kind of, well, it's nice to have them here, but they're not really one of us, you know, type of thing. Kind of hard to say that. I really don't know how to answer that question. I mean, it's the same nationwide. Blacks are at the lower end of the economic scale, along with uh, Hispanics and Native Americans, Native Americans at the very bottom, of course. Um, but there are also Blacks prominent in Oregon in many levels, in, in uh, politics, in uh, the media, in business. And um, so it's hard to say in, in uh, education, um, in the professions. So though that would not have been possible 100 years ago or, or 50 or 60 years ago, I, I guess. And so there certainly have been a lot of changes, you know, for the better. Um, as most of us know, the increase in blacks in Oregon really occurred during World War II, during the, the uh, development of the shipyards at Vanport um, and Swabby Island in that period. 
So clearly blacks in Oregon are better off than they used to be, but they're certainly not at the same um, uh, level of standard of living. It's... Greg, in your research, um, oh, geez. Name skips me now. Anybody remember his name? Ken Kesey wrote about him um, in the last go. Yeah, he did. Makes a great story. Uh, yeah. At any rate, so uh, and and so there's a, a black family in Pendleton in the teens. Uh, were there blacks in uh, all of your research? And uh, at the time, the only place that had significant numbers of whites uh, in the 30s and 40s was the Lam Willamette Valley. But as the rest of the state build up. Were there other instances that you've come across where black families came to Oregon or black cowboys? I can tell you about my southern Oregon was a, uh, an area of great hostility toward blacks. My first newspaper job was with the Medford Mail Tribune and I was I joined the came down there from Portland. At that time there was not a single black living in Jackson County, certainly none in Medford and I don't think in Jackson County, it was hostile to them. The editor of the newspaper at the time was a fellow named Eric Allen, Eric Allen Jr., who was very famous in uh, Oregon journalism history. He was a liberal in a very conservative uh, area and he wrote editorials that made people mad, but people had to read them. So Eric worked out with the Federal Aviation Administration to bring a black family into Medford. He, and he could work at the airport in the airport facilities out there. So this gentleman arrived with a lot of newspaper support and brought his family, wife and kids. A lot of effort was made by Eric and other people who to try to accept him and make him feel welcome. But a, a cross was burned on his lawn one night and there was a lot of other hostility things thrown at his house and that sort of thing reflecting the community's uh, unhappiness of the black in the present so he moved away and um, not surprising because of the hostility that he received so that particular experiment failed now fast forward to the almost to the end of my not the end of my career but well into my journalism career when i'm now back working at the oregonian and I'm covering the campaign of Jesse Jackson um, in Oregon when he was running for president of what, 19, 19, 1984, 1985, can't quite remember the year, which is my, uh, my mental breakdown. But anyway, Jesse was running for president with a campaign around Oregon. And I thought this was, and one of the places he was going to go was Jackson County. And I thought, this is interesting. He went to Redmond, others places where he was very, very well received. And he spoke at the Jackson County Fairgrounds. I was astounded. Instead of being signs opposing him and critical of him, the place was packed with people, all white people who were cheering him and applauding him. And, and the guy got a lot of votes in Jackson County. And I don't know what really turned attitudes around in Jackson County, but what a contrast, you know, in that period. I think he might even have carried Jackson County in the primary in that period. Um, so there's kind of anecdotally a story and how blacks were received in Oregon. There aren't many blacks still in Jackson County, I'm sure, but there are a few. Mm -hmm. So the other big exclusion um, issue in, or in Oregon was uh, Asians, right? The Chinese Exclusion Act, yes. In Congress in yeah, 1882, Chinese that's the Chinese Exclusion Act. Oregon did not pass its own because you had the federal government to rely on. Chinese, if you read the original Oregon Constitution, you would see a lot of hostile uh, hostile wording on the rights of, against the rights of Chinese, the rights of Hawaiians. And of course, the rights of blacks that we've talked about. <laughs> the, uh, there was an effort in the Constitutional Convention to include Chinese, to exclude Chinese from Oregon, have an exclusion act specifically against Chinese in that period. But one of the, uh, a couple of delegates argued, well, they make great house servants, and so we need them here. And so that did not pass. But they weren't allowed to own property. and. Um, and or vote uh, and those sort of things, although those things happened anyway. 
it's probably so, it's probably noteworthy to mention that a lot of the a lot of the laws against minorities, um, exclusion exclusion laws for and things, were not rigidly implied. I mean, they were on the books. For example, I'll talk about my ancestor, Reuben Shipley. Although he was not supposed to be, be a property owner, the constitution prevented him from owning property. Nevertheless, was the owner of 100 acres down in, uh, in uh, Phil Philomath in the uh, And um, it's because the community favorably received him. Reuben Shipley was property and proper, was popular in the county and because of the work that he had done. And so he was allowed, quote unquote, to own his hundred acres of property, even though the constitution prevented him from owning the property. And that went on in many different places. Um, blacks could own businesses. The, we mentioned earlier the, uh, the Francis's who were prominent uh, uh, store owners in Portland. They su supposedly couldn't own that store but they were well admired. They happened to both be educated. And one was a, f a personal friend of Frederick Douglass, who, uh, who you probably know of, who would come out in part to help to integrate Oregon. And so they were, while they were eventually excluded or ordered excluded from Oregon, they were allowed to stay anyway. I see uh, Anna's got a link there for people wanting uh, uh, more interest or uh, educational materials on blacks in Oregon. A couple of them from Anna Bird. Um, any other questions out there? Um, what, uh, we can jump forward to how, how many Japanese were impacted? How much with the, uh, with the internment camps. Was that a big deal at all in Oregon? It was not like California or Washington. Big deal in Oregon, oh yeah. I can remember as a kid shopping at the, what was it, sort of the, the Portland market down along the Willamette River and Japanese were among the, the clerks working there and a couple were kind of family favorites. We liked to buy stuff from them. And then one day they weren't there and I was just a kid. Well, what happened to, to these folks we used to be so friendly with? And we're told that they'd been removed to internment camps. So there's one in Idaho, there was one in uh, Northern California, and I'm not sure there was one in Oregon in that period, but um, they were removed, their property was lost to them. Yeah. Well, I have to double think there because that the first or second fish trap, or no, early one, we did World War II and we had Wakatsuki Houston who wrote the book, Farewell to Manzanar. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, a uh, and Richard White was our historian that year, and he talked about um, the internment camps as being uh, propaganda uh, driven rather than any actual security concerns. He said if there would have been cons security concerns, Hawaii would have been targeted, but they needed the laborers <laughs> and not uh, Hawaii. At any rate. A woman who had been at every fish trap up till that time said, you don't know what it was like to live in Hood River then and got up and stomped out of the room and never came back. Wow. So I'm sure that, uh, and there was a book about that, right? Isn't there a book about Hood River? Twig, Stubborn Twig? Stubborn Twig, yeah, won a uh, Oregon Book Award, I believe, right? Yeah. Is that on the, on the Japanese who lived there? We know, we have a lot of, a uh, lot of, I guess, and that's not a bit of, no, we have a number of, of Japanese friends here who are descended from families who spent time in the camps, in the internment camps, and tell horrendous stories about, well, for one, they don't like to talk about it, but those who do will tell horrendous stories about losing their property. And um, but success stories too, how they organized in the camps. But they were I, you know, patriotic people. They were Americans. They weren't trying to undermine our country or or support the Japanese movement. And they were just, so they were really mistreated. It was a hugely uh, unjust what happened to the Japanese in that period. I think the Supreme Court later ruled that it was unlawful on Constitution. So, uh, Evelyn, right at the beginning, I mentioned that you'd written a recent magazine article about the deathbed confession during the Chinese massacre. 
you, Robert Miller Gamillan, yes, uh huh? Yeah, you 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 might. Uh, that's that's wandering, but it's still a racial issue. So, uh, do you want to tell us well, yeah, briefly yeah. what happened? It's a kind of a fascinating story because if you anybody who's read Massacred for Gold, you would find out that one of the gang of killers of three dozen. Uh, Chinese miners was a 15 year old kid. He was in the gang, whether he actually did any killing himself, I don't know, but he was tried for murder and found innocent. But several years later in the Washington, when he was about 18, he confessed to his father that yes, I was there, I was one of the gang. But I just basically had that name and the confession and, and but knew nothing about him. But a descendant of his who lives in Maryland contacted me about it and sent me some information on him. And so it, she actually told the family story, became a family story. She wrote about his parents, how devastating they were, about his sisters, how devastating they were, how one of his sisters had ended up marrying another member of the, of the gang. And so it became kind of a separate story that's not in the book because they didn't have it at the time. So I wrote an article on uh, uh, Robert Millen and made it a family story and it ran in the Columbia Magazine, the publication of the Washington State Historical, so Historical Society in their last issue. Yeah. Okay. Fun to do. Okay. Um, anybody else out there, you wanna type something in or uh... Or do you want to uh, just speak up? We've got a couple minutes left. Thank you very, very much, Greg. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I'll get all of you word on uh, uh, and a link to the, uh, to the movie that Greg is, or to the documentary <laughs> uh, Greg is interviewed in. And we'll watch that and then we'll have a discussion of that uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so somebody else is commenting on uh, uh, German prisoners of war. Uh, I think that, uh, and what, what, what is Ann Morrison? German prisoners around Nyssa and Adrian, they were trucked to Fruitland, led uh, Idaho to work in the orchards and treated far better than the Japanese Americans. Um, I think that, I've, I've heard that, that song before too. Uh, German prisoners, uh, the irony of, of uh, having our own prisoners beside the German prisoners of war. Okay, anybody else out there? Any final words, Greg? I think, thank you yeah, very sure. much. That was a it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you all um, and appreciate the questions. Um, I might have rambled a little bit, but that's my nature is to ramble a little bit. And um, so you put up with me to, for that period. I just think that what is the history of, of, of African-Americans, the slave history in Oregon is, is one, of, uh, one of, of we should be shameful about and learn from. Somebody asked me, has asked a long way, why do we need to know this? Well, I was reading in the Times yesterday, New York Times about an article about the, uh, with the draft riots uh, during the Civil War period in New York. And it mentioned how much those riots were actually riots against blacks who lived in uh, New York in that period and how they were burned out of their homes and many of them were killed in that period. I didn't know that. But the last paragraph of this article written by uh, somebody, Elizabeth Mitchell says the following, and she's mentioning that merchants came to the aid of the blacks who had lost their, uh, been burned out of their homes. The story of the merchant's response is a reminder that we can all do more if we don't want the lives of more black people to be marred by cruelty. That begins with having a clear eyed view of our own history, understanding the past in a way that's neither sugar coated nor whitewashed will keep us moving forward. And that's something that I applaud and I think is relevant. You know, why we do need to know these events that happen in our history. And we do ourselves no favors by not uh, not teaching some of these things that go in our schools and making them available to students. We should know it's part of our history, it's part of our DNA, and um, it's shaped who we are in our attitudes today. It explains such things as why historically there have been so few blacks in Oregon. 
Uh, we're one of the whitest states. Of what this is, we're part of the whitest city of any size in the country. These things have explanations. Is that bad? Not necessarily so, um, but it has an explanation. And um, anyway, thank you very much. You've been a good attentive audience and I didn't see anybody try to throw anything at me from the, from the different blocks out there. Okay. Well, you got a bunch of thank yous on the chat there too. So you can click on your chat. Okay. If you figure out how to click on your chat. Click on my chat. Get, okay. You, <laughs> Thanks a lot, Vish. Good seeing you. Did you have ice up there like we had down here? We had an inch and a half. No, we, got a bunch of snow when you, we got a bunch of snow when you got your ice. And then uh, yesterday, oh, we, 50 degrees. And so there's ice now out there. But uh, yeah. Well, it's nice here yeah. to uh, the devastation to trees around Portland and particularly the area that I live in, West Atlanta, just incredible. You know, broken, smashed trees everywhere, a number of which hit houses, of course. We were without power here in our house for a week, and fortunately, we were able to bunk with my uh, son-in-law over in Oregon City. We did have power, but it was cold. Anyway, thanks again. Nice to have. Nice to be here. Thanks, Rich. Well, nice having you, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay, Greg. We'll do that. And yeah. uh, you know, we we uh, we, yeah. So we'll we'll catch with you when that next book comes out too, okay? That's a good deal. Yes, it will be out sometime probably October. I think the readers reviews our reader reader copies are coming out next month, I believe. Steve Forrester is putting it together out of Astoria. Okay. So okay. Well, thank you everybody much for coming and we'll uh, we'll, we'll see you all again soon. I did not Zoom. know this. The Statue of Liberty has a foot with a broken chain on it to represent the Black experience. I never heard that before. Well, That's true. well interesting, Jane. Thank you. There you go. Thanks. There okay, you go. take care. I'm reading through this stuff. And you, uh, there, you saw that Al Josephi was in here. That's uh, you I quoted. Did, I did yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah, he's the one, he's kind of a little bit of a policy wonk. He's the one that asked about uh, whether it was referendum or uh, or uh, or uh, legislative action on the repeal of the Exclusion Act. Yeah, the, uh, you know, it was, almost, it was almost not mentioned in the press when it was done. It was just such an embarrassment that it was still there all yes it was a vote it wasn't part of a it was in the constitution you know people had to vote on it right okay all right take there care thanks again okay take care i'm leaving too thank Bye. you all thank we'll you so much you soon.